On May 22, 2015, analysts predicted that AMD would go bankrupt within a few short years. It's now seven years later, and AMD is one of the most valuable tech companies in the world. So what happened? Well, I dug into it, and what I found was a story full of backstabbing, spying, stealing, secret payoffs, and court cases going back decades. So in this video, I'm going to show you the secret war between Intel and AMD, a war that's still being fought today. Let's start at the beginning. It's the mid-1960s, a few years before Neil Armstrong would even walk on the moon and a man named Robert Noyce was hard at work designing the very first compact integrated circuits. He worked at Fairchild Semiconductor. Robert Noyce and his team were at the cutting edge of circuit design, and by the late 1960s, Noyce's semiconductor division was responsible for over two-thirds of Fairchild's total revenue. In fact, the processes and tools that Fairchild Semiconductor developed, like making circuits using silicon, are actually still the building blocks of the most advanced processors today. Things seemed to be going relatively well for Fairchild Semiconductor. That is, until they weren't. In the fall of 1967, Fairchild Camera and Instrument suffered their first revenue loss in over a decade. This was in large part because of their founder, Sherman Fairchild. Instead of pouring money back into his highly successful semiconductor division, Sherman kept making unprofitable investments into new ventures. And as a result, he and Robert Noyce were constantly butting heads. The last straw came when one day, Sherman passed Robert up for a promotion that everyone thought he had in the bag. In response, Robert hatched a secret plan. He would start a new company with Fairchild's head of research and development, a man named Gordon Moore, the same Gordon Moore who coined Moore's Law. In 1968, Noyce and Moore left Fairchild to start a little semiconductor company called Intel. Their leaving actually caused a mass exodus from Fairchild, and Intel was soon hiring many of Fairchild's key staff that wanted to keep working on the cutting edge of circuit design. But, less than a year later, eight more executives left Fairchild to start a different company. Jerry Sanders, Jack Gifford, Ed Turney, and a handful of other bigwigs went on to start Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD. That's pretty much the end of the road for Fairchild Semiconductor. But little did anyone know that Fairchild's two young spin-offs, Intel and AMD, would go on to have one of the most intense rivalries in Silicon Valley history. You want a piece of me? I don't want a piece of you. I want the whole thing! Oh! In 1971, Intel came out with the first microprocessor, the 4-bit Intel 4004. This baby had a whopping 2,000 transistors and a blazing 750 kilohertz clock speed. Even though it was millions of times simpler and thousands of times slower than the chips we have today, the Intel 4004 started the microprocessor revolution and the race that came with it. Around this time, AMD was considered a second source supplier for microchips, which means that they were licensed to make parts that were designed by other companies like Fairchild and National Semiconductor. Making microchips is hard, and many microchips from that era came with serious defects and reliability issues. So AMD started getting a reputation for having high quality products that were reliable enough to be used in early computers, communication devices, and military applications. In 1974, Intel released the 8008, which was the successor to their 4004. Then, just one year later, AMD came out with their own microprocessor, called the AM9080. The special thing about AMD's 9080 is that it was a reverse-engineered copy of Intel's 8008, and AMD made it by photographing an early version of Intel's chip, developing designs based on those images, and then making improvements along the way. Talk about corporate espionage at its finest. Well, guess what Intel did after AMD stole and improved their designs? In a pretty unexpected twist, Intel decided to enter a licensing agreement with AMD instead of suing them. This agreement allowed AMD to build and sell chips designed by Intel. And in exchange, Intel also got access to AMD's designs and their patents, which they could use with their own products. And this worked out pretty nicely for both companies, until 1982. It's now the early 80s, and people were already using computers for tasks like talking to coworkers, recording and transferring data, and even playing games. Personal computing was going to be the next hot market, so IBM moved from making mainframe computer systems to personal ones. The processor they chose for their computers was the Intel 8086, 
but as part of this massive purchasing agreement, IBM specified that AMD had to be the secondary source. They wanted to guarantee a supply of chips. So Intel was winning contracts because AMD could back them up and help supply these processors at massive scales. AMD was winning contracts because they could leverage Intel's cutting edge designs and reliably manufacture them at scale. And this is how Intel and AMD worked together to make the first wave of processors for PC manufacturers like IBM. Compaq and all of their competitors. That is, until the Intel 286. One of the special things about the Intel 286 is that it could multitask, which at the time was revolutionary. Intel offered the 286 at speeds from 6 to 10 megahertz, but then AMD released their own version of this processor called the AM286. Wait, can AMD do that? That's exactly what Intel said and whether their licensing agreement allowed AMD to modify and improve on Intel's designs is still being argued in court to this day. And before you think about investing in either of these companies today, make sure to go to Simply Wall Street to understand their valuations. Simply Wall Street steps investors through an entire checklist of factors like past performance, current financial health, future cash flows, and even how invested a company's executives are all in a way that's easy to understand. Simply Wall Street is free to use forever, but if you want to evaluate more companies each month or you want access to their powerful stock screener, you can use my links to get an extended free trial and 30% off your subscription when you sign up. I'll link their pages on Intel and AMD for you in the description below. For now, I'm adding AMD to my True Disruptors watch list, which I'll be building as I keep finding innovators worth investing in. So consider subscribing if you want to follow along as I keep building out this list. Okay, let's get back to the early 80s. The AM286 was a big threat to Intel because it meant that AMD could just take Intel's designs, improve them, and release them under their own name. So Intel broke their licensing agreement and stopped sharing their designs with AMD altogether. As a result, AMD took Intel to court, arguing that their agreement covered all of Intel's current and future products. Intel argued that the legal wording of their agreement let Intel specify which products AMD could support. After almost five years, the courts reached their judgment. Intel wasn't obligated to transfer every new product to AMD. And as a result, AMD was frozen out of Intel's future chip designs, which made Intel the sole supplier of their latest processor, the Intel 386. The Intel 386 was a big deal because it was the first 32-bit processor, meaning it could crunch bigger numbers and store more in memory. This chip is what made GUIs, or graphical user interfaces, possible. For example, Microsoft's Windows 2.1 let people use a physical device called a mouse to point, click, and move digital objects on a screen. Thanks to innovations like the mouse and the GUI, the PC market more than tripled in size from 1987 to 1990, and this was not a good time for AMD to be locked out of Intel's designs. So AMD did what they did best, and copied Intel's design for the 386, but this time they adopted what's called a clean room approach. A clean room approach is where you reverse engineer something and figure out a way to rebuild it without infringing on the copyrights of the original design. This obviously took AMD a lot longer to pull off, and four years after the Intel 386 came out, AMD successfully released the AM386. It was 20% faster than Intel's, but it was too little, too late. Intel was already coming out with the next generation of their processors, the Intel 486, which was over twice as fast as their previous models. And this happened again with the 486. AMD took four years to successfully reverse engineer it, make it about 20% better, and release it just in time for Intel to move on to their newer architecture. Penta is the Greek word for five, so instead of naming their next generation of processors the 586, Intel named them Pentium. The Pentium 1 clocked at around 300 megahertz, and the Pentium 2 clocked in at around 450. Intel was well on their way to being the first chip maker to build a processor at a 1 gigahertz speed and cement their dominance in the CPU market. There was no way that AMD could reverse engineer the Pentium processor and add enough speed to it before Intel came out with their next generation chip. And the chips that AMD were designing at the time were plagued with manufacturing issues and weren't meeting their own performance goals. From 1990 to 1995, AMD's revenue roughly doubled, but Intel's more than quadrupled, and the gap between them was only growing wider. So AMD had to do something new to close this gap and take Intel by surprise. But what could they do? AMD ended up spending around $900 million to buy a fabulous chip design company called NextGen. 
Fabulous just means that Next Gen didn't have a fabrication plant of their own, but what they did have was fresh designs for high performance processors. But that's not all AMD got out of this acquisition. It turns out that Next Gen's COO and executive vice president was a man named Vinod Dam, who headed the development of Intel's Pentium processors before joining Next Gen. Talk about a small world. So the father of the Pentium chips ended up working for AMD and had an instrumental role in their latest chip designs before leaving to join another startup. AMD was back in the race, and in 1999, they released the first Athlon processors, which actually competed with Intel's latest Pentium 3s when they came out. The special thing about these processors is that they ran at 1000 megahertz, or one gigahertz. Oh yeah, and they shipped one week before Intel's, meaning AMD actually won the race to make the first one gigahertz processor. After that, AMD's reputation shifted from being a budget option to being a premium brand in their own right. And after that, AMD started stacking up some big wins. In 2003, AMD's new Athlon 64 became the first processor to support 64-bit instructions. By 2006, AMD was charging over $1,000 for their highest-end processors, which were releasing earlier than Intel's while performing better. AMD also started targeting Intel's server processors, releasing the AMD Opteron series to compete with Intel's Xeon chips, which were the state of the art at the time. AMD's Opteron chips for servers actually beat the Xeon so bad that Intel ended up ditching their entire underlining design architecture for them altogether. AMD wasn't just fighting Intel on all fronts, they were winning. Yes. It's now 2006. The last Rocky movie, Rocky Balboa, just came out. You know how in the Rocky movies, Sylvester Stallone ends up spending most of the fight getting beat up, only to make a crazy comeback at the last second? Intel is Rocky. Rocky isn't about to win the speed game, so he needs to win in a different way. After AMD pummeled them, Intel went back to the basics. They dropped the Pentium name and the design, and they focused on building low-power, high-throughput chips. If they couldn't win on raw speed, they would have to stay cooler, cost less, and complete more instructions per clock cycle. And that's exactly what happened when Intel released their Core 2 Duos. These chips were much smaller than AMD's Athlon 64s, yet they had more than double the transistor count, and they crushed AMD's chips in almost every meaningful benchmark. By the end of 2006, AMD's market share of all CPUs collapsed from 48% to 37%, which is the worst one-year decline in the company's history. It was now AMD's turn to lose on every front. In 2006, AMD spent $5.4 billion, or around 50% of their total market cap, to buy a graphics card manufacturer called ATI Technologies. Just for reference, Disney bought Pixar that same year for $7.4 billion, and Pixar went on to transform the entire movie industry. AMD eventually had to take a $2.7 billion write-down on their huge ATI deal, which was a huge blow to their shareholders. Oh yeah, and those ATI graphics cards that they just spent all that money acquiring? Those were getting outperformed by Nvidia's GTX cards. But that's a different story altogether. AMD also decided to drop the Athlon name, kind of like how Intel dropped the Pentium name. Except where Pentium was associated with Intel's failures, Athlon was AMD's most successful product line ever. Meanwhile, their Opteron server processors were being recalled due to a memory issue that caused them to slow down and eventually freeze, a bug that also made it into their desktop processors. As bad as all this sounds, AMD wasn't totally responsible for their own downfall. It turns out that while AMD was imploding, Intel was paying other manufacturers billions of dollars to keep AMD's chips out of new PCs. For example, a class action lawsuit revealed that Dell was secretly receiving up to a billion dollars in kickbacks from Intel simply for not using AMD in any of their products. And from 2003 to 2006, Intel ended up paying Dell, HP, and Lenovo hundreds of millions of dollars per quarter not to use competitors' products. In 2009, Intel was fined a billion dollars for this antitrust violation. And even though they admitted to making these payments, Intel claims they did nothing illegal. The court case over this antitrust claim is still ongoing to this day as well. Sorry to interrupt, but there are some policemen here. In 2011, AMD was starting to crumble. From 2011 to 2015, their revenues dropped by 40%, and their market cap dropped by two-thirds. Their market share in server processors dropped from over 20% to under 2%. And in 2015, analysts predicted that AMD would go bankrupt by the end of the decade due to, quote, a toxic combination of non-competitive products, 
technological leaps by their competitors, severe structural features, ineffective policies, and a deteriorating balance sheet, end quote. In October of 2014, AMD's CEO, Rory Reed stepped down and was replaced with Dr. Lisa Su. Lisa Su was only with AMD for three years before she became the CEO. But when it comes to semiconductors, Lisa Su is a bona fide badass. She got a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in electrical engineering from MIT. Then she became the VP of semiconductor research at IBM. After that, she was the chief technology officer and head of R&D for Freescale Semiconductor until she joined AMD in 2012. There, she was the senior VP and general manager for their global business units before becoming AMD's CEO in 2014. That's when she changed everything. AMD would no longer manufacture most of their chips. Instead, they partnered with the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, also known as TSMC. And at a time when smartphones were blowing up and the mobile industry was growing by triple digits, Lisa Su cut AMD's mobile projects entirely. By mid-2015, she and her executive team presented a long-term strategy where AMD would focus on designing processors, graphics chips, and accelerators for just three markets, personal computers, data centers, and high-end gaming. She also scrapped several projects, iterating on their current CPU architecture, which was called Bulldozer. So this plan put a lot of AMD's current revenue at risk, but it paid off. AMD announced their first Ryzen processors, which ran on a new architecture called Zen. They claimed these chips worked 40% faster than their current chips, which raised a lot of eyebrows since AMD had been delivering modest 10% improvements each year for years now. But when these Ryzen chips finally came out, AMD delivered on every promise. The special thing about these chips is that each core could run two threads in parallel, and multiple cores could be linked together to scale the chip. For example, the Zen 3 architecture links 8 groups of 4 cores for a total of 32 cores, running 64 threads in parallel. And with TSMC making these chips, AMD could focus on designing even better chips faster using this architecture. AMD's latest server chips are also built on this Zen architecture, and researchers currently expect their market share in servers to climb from around 10% to around 18% by 2024. Not a bad turnaround at all especially when you consider that they also dominate the console gaming market. Microsoft's Xbox and Sony's PlayStations have been using AMD-based chips since 2013, and the current PlayStation 5 actually runs AMD CPUs and AMD graphics processors. Meanwhile, production issues are piling up for Intel, who has been trying to upgrade their own manufacturing process to the same processes used by TSMC. Intel's 10 nanometer chips were promised back in 2016, but they didn't come out until mid-2019. By then, AMD was outselling Intel's desktop chips 2 to 1, and Apple, one of Intel's biggest clients, dropped them to start designing their own chips and ordering them directly from TSMC. Likewise, Intel's 7 nanometer chips were supposed to come out in 2020, but they're currently delayed until at least 2023. And now it's Intel who has a new CEO with a new bold plan to regain their dominance in the chip market. And so, the war between Intel and AMD rages on. But there's another chip company that's coming for the semiconductor crown, and it's actually bigger than Intel and AMD combined. If you want to know about the secret semiconductor giant, check out this episode next. And if you feel I've earned it, consider hitting that like button and leaving a comment to let me know what you want to see next. Either way, thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.